And welcome once again to Faith and Victory Church Online. How are you doing tonight? So glad to be with you and blessed to be uh, a part of your uh, Wednesday night with the Word of God. And we trust you'll be blessed by um, the things we teach tonight and bring to you in Jesus' name. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that the Word of God will be light and light to those that are listening. We thank you, Father, that we'll, understanding will come that the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit, will be anointing me to speak and anointing the ears of the hearers to hear and receive that which the Spirit speaks into their lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you. Let's jump right in here. We were talking about last time we were together, um, the resurrection of Christ. And we talked about the importance of the resurrection of Christ. And so what we're doing now is we're going to begin to talk about this week the nature and manner of Christ's revelation. Praise God. And so let's jump right in here. The resurrection of Jesus um, was the work of the entire Trinity. Hallelujah. Let's look at this. But number one, by God the Father. And uh, we look in Ephesians chapter 1 and 19 and 20. And um, in what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And then Acts 4, 24, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And then Acts 10, 40, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. And then, uh, finally, Acts chapter 13, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Glory to God. The Father was involved in the resurrection of Christ. Can I get some amens out there? Some glory, hallelujahs, and some, even a couple of shandais. Praise God. Um, by his own power, the Son, um, Jesus said, Therefore, uh, over in um, Luke chapter, I mean John chapter ten, verse seventeen and eighteen, therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I had the power to lay it down, and I had the power to take it again. Now, when Jesus speaks of his own body under the uh, under the uh, image of a temple, or rep, you know, in, in, in an allegorical sense of the temple, he says he represents its restoration as his own work. Over in John chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple, referring to his body, and in three days I will raise it up. Hallelujah. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus acted separately from the Father, but it does, it does show the great miracle, in this great miracle of his resurrection, he was not passive. He was involved. Glory to God. Think of the fact of a dead man raising himself. Praise God forever. Hallelujah. And thirdly, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 states, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Glory to God. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, Word quickens old English for make it alive, made alive, hallelujah, by the Spirit. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 11, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's Romans 8, 11. And so here we have it. The resurrection was a work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Praise God forever. So make shout out there. Glory to God. Thank God that the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, when they're involved in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Glory to God. Now, let's go to this next point. This is, that is vital, that is important, that... Um, the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of, you know, uh, men's natural minds try to get involved in. 
uh, because you know they're they've got the Sanhedrin. I mean, the uh, Sadducees. We still have that Sadduceeical spirit in the in the world today that don't believe in the resurrection. And uh, I'm a Pharisee. I believe in. I'm fair, you see. I believe in the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection was an actual bodily resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah. Jesus actually died. The swoon theory, uh, that he merely swooned upon the cross and pity and, and pity in hands took him down thinking he had died. <coughs> and then the cool air of the tomb with which he laid revived him so that he came forth as though he had really risen from the dead is obviously completely false. That is carnal men <coughs> trying to explain away the supernatural. A supernatural, supernatural event that had to take place so that the Lamb of God could become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He died for us so we can live in him. There's no such, the swoon theory is just a bunch of idiots out there coming up with stuff that they think they're educated um, beyond their intelligence or beyond spiritual intelligence. They got a devil and because uh, they deny the truth. They deny the word. Hallelujah. Um. He appeared to his disciples in the full bloom of health and strength. Otherwise, he could not have had the effect upon them in which he did. The results of hanging on the cross for six hours left a human body in such physical condition it could not have been restored in only three days. Here's some, here's some proofs from the Word of God about Jesus actually dying. The soldiers saw that he was dead. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was dead already. They break not his legs. That's John 19, verse 13. These are professional Roman soldiers who were used to conducting crucifixions and could not be deceived that their work was not finished. Secondly, the centurion had testified to his death, or attested to his death. The centurion in charge of the crucifixion brought his personal report to Pilate, he assured the Roman governor that Jesus was indeed dead. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead and calling him upon calling unto him the centurion, he asked whether he had uh, been any while dead. And when he knew it, of uh, the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Mark chapter 15, verses 44 and 45. So we have here, the Roman soldiers didn't break his legs. What they would do is they would break their legs to, in, to ex expedite death, you know, by pain, you know, the, the, the excruciating pain of what was going on, uh, adding more pain to it, heart attacks, you just you know, give up and die, okay? Third, blood and water flowed from his side. Now, they wanted to just double check when they went to make sure Jesus was dead, so in, to ensure that there wasn't the slightest possibility that uh, he would exist in any, you know, that, that there was any life left in Jesus, one of the soldiers pierced his side with, the lan with a lance or a spear. And authorities have claimed that flowing forth of blood and water is a physiological evidence that his heart was ruptured and, um, and that death would be almost instantaneous. Hallelujah. Um, exp the Expedition of Gospel of John quotes from an article in the Calvin Forum written by a prominent physician in Grad Rapids, Michigan, Dr. Stewart. Bergisma, <laughs> we're just going to leave that one, Berg, Bergsma, Bergsma, there we go, I got it right, to the effect that blood and water flowing from a spear wound could have only come from a ruptured heart. Now, what happens is that there's a sack around your heart, and they call it the heart sack, and Jesus' heart had ruptured, and in the time while he was there, the white corpuscles and red corpuscles separated, and they do that. When, um, when someone dies, if they're like laying on the floor or laying out like that, and they die, uh, you'll, you'll look at them and they'll be like pale on one, you know, one side and bluish colored on the other. And that's because the blood serum has separated and settled. And uh, when they came to Jesus and pierced his side, they, rupt, they, they pierced into that heart sac 
and the white serum of the blood came out first so it looked like water and then the red thicker corpuscles came out behind it um, and so that's why we get the you know the testimony of the blood of the water and the blood coming out of him hallelujah and so, so when the when the soldier appears to side John 19 34 and forthwith came out blood and water that's the separating of the blood into the clear into the, the thicker red um, um, corpuscles plasmas whatever okay and so we have this is the third testimony number four Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea, Arimathea believed that he was dead. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, who also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus in Mark 15, 43, so that he could bury him in the sepulcher that he had. Hallelujah. And, um, and then the women who stood by the cross believed that he died. As soon as the Sabbath day was passed, they came with spices to anoint a body, a, a dead body. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and Salmon had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him in Mark 16, 1. And then final testimony comes from Jesus Christ himself. Jesus would know if he were dead or not. Yeah. Jesus said he died. Jesus, who is the truth, declared that he died. In Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. Hallelujah. We have every reason to believe that Christ's resurrection was a genuine resurrection of one who was indeed dead dead hallelujah now these aren't new theories that you know about, about him not really dying and it was only a you know this is just that's just the carrying on of the gnostic teachings from the early century um that they had already gotten into church that devil was already running around trying to deny the death burial and resurrection of jesus because it's core it's central to redemption as we've already covered it was a bodily resurrection. It wasn't a spiritual resurrection where, you know, only a spiritual thing. Casper got up and walked off. His physical body was raised from the dead. The word resurrection, as it is used of the Lord Jesus Christ about 12 different times in the New Testament, can only signify the resurrection of the body. <coughs> There's an abundant of, 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 of evidence and proof that the body of our Lord was really literally raised to life again first his resurrection body was composed of flesh and bones it was not a phantom look we're going to read from um, Luke chapter 24 verses 36 through 39 and as they thus spake Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them peace be unto you but they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. Uh, this is, this it is, I myself handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now, we understand man is a spirit, has a soul, lives in a body. But he's saying this isn't, this isn't a spiritual manifestation. There's actual physical flesh here. Handle me. Touch me. When uh, they tell Thomas about it, he can, I, say, I, you know, I thrust my hand, finger into the palm of his hands and my hand into his side. I'll not believe. Jesus shows up and says, Thomas, take forth thine hand and reach forth the head of thy hand and thrust thy finger into the palm of my hands. Thrust thy hand into my side and be not faithless but believing. Hallelujah. His, you know, the resurrection body could be touched and felt. And as he, they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hell. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him in Matthew 28, 9. Behold my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, Luke 24, 39. 
Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. Behold my hands. Reach uh, hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. In John 20, 27. Again, we're talking about physical resurrection. He ate before them. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Luke 24, 41 through 43. This is the pirates of the Caribbean where they're drinking in the blood. You know, the wine's coming out to the bones, you know, you know because they're, they're, you know, they're whatever. I guess the original uh, zombies, <laughs> original walking dead. <coughs> 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 Hallelujah. <coughs> Next, so we have these three so far. Next, the disciples recognized him. It's a natural response that they recognized him by his physical features. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Luke 24, 31. Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, that is to say, Master. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord, and he had spoken to her these things in Luke, I mean, in John 20, 16 and 18. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord, John 20, 20. And therefore that disciple who, yeah, we might, let, let's make something spiritual out of that. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Praise God, it's 2020. We it might be John 2020, but it's the year 2020. We see the Lord, and praise God, we rejoice. Amen. Come on now. Help me out here, church. Um, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. In John 21 and 7. Glory to God. He appeared to have the same body into which the nails had been driven and the spear had been thrust. And we'll, you know, we'll cover some scriptures again. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet, Luke 24, 40. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side, John 20, 20. The scripture indicates that these same wounds will be visible in his body when he comes again. And they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. That's prophecy. And one shall say unto the other, What are these wounds in thine hand? And then he shall answer, the, Those which I was wounded in the house of my friends, Zechariah 13 and 6. And behold he, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Revelation 1 and 7. So we have here, Bible showing us that Jesus will bear these marks in his body forever. It is the sign of our redemption. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Six, Jesus himself foretold his bodily resurrection. Glory to God. Amen. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Jesus said he would raise that body up from the dead. Glory to God. And then number seven, David, prophesying by the Holy Ghost, um, prophesied that his body would be raised up. And we have in Psalm 16, 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. The Jews, in keeping with others in eastern lands, believed that corruption of the body set in on the fourth day after death. Jesus was raised on the third day. This gives significance to Martha's words concerning her brother Lazarus. Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days. John 11 and 39. So, you know, when, when Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead, it was past the three-day mark for, you know, the Jewish belief. Um, they believed the spirit stayed with the body for three days. <coughs> 
and um, but they also believe that corruption set in. But the Bible said Jesus would not see corruption, and so he was raised on the third day. Okay, it was a unique resurrection. There are eight incidents, eight incidents, <laughs> incidences, hallelujah, uh, of human bodies being raised from the dead as recorded in Scripture. They are the son of the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17 through 24. <coughs> and then we have the Shunammite woman's son in 2 Kings 4, 17 through 27. The man who was laid on the bones of Elisha in 2 Kings 13, 21. Yeah, remember that? They were, they were out in battle, and uh, one of the young men got killed, and they didn't have time to bury him, so they just threw him in Elisha's sepulcher. He rolled down, ran up against the bones, and uh, they're out running, and next thing you know, here, comes, here, here he comes, running behind. Hey, guys, wait up, wait up. I bet they ran faster than they've ever run in their life. Hallelujah. So they just, they just threw him in the sepulcher dead. Glory to God. And which was the uh, 14th miracle of Elisha, the double portion. Hallelujah. That 14th one was posthumously. Glory to God. Um, Jairus' daughter in Mark 15, 5, 22 through 43, Jesus raising her from the dead. The young man of Nain in Luke 7, uh, 11 through 17. Lazarus in John 11. Uh, Tabitha in Acts 9, 36 through 43. And Eutychus in Acts 20, verses 7 through 12. These, we have every reason to believe from Scripture and, and, and no implication in Scripture that these were immortal resurrections um, with an immortal body. They eventually died again. <coughs> Jesus was more, than a was more than a reversal of his death. 1 Timothy 6, 16 tells us that he alone hath immortality. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Romans chapter 6, verses 9, uh, 9 and 10. Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. In Revelation 1.18. Though the body that was raised from the Joseph's tomb was the same body in which Jesus had lived and ministered, it was somewhat different. Yeah. It was a spiritual body. Now, don't get weirded out. It was a spiritual body, one not bound by physical limitations. Glorif let's maybe use the word glorified body. Okay? He could enter a room through the doors were shut. And the same day at evening, when the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples assembled for fear of the Jews, King Jesus stood in the midst. And again, after eight days, his disciples were within, and Thomas sat uh, with them, and came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst. So um, his body, being glorified, doesn't have physical uh, constraints of this realm. It's able to function in a higher level. The way man was created to function in the beginning. Again, Jesus' resurrected body was unique in that it was not recognizable at times. Uh, the incident of the two disciples on the way to e Emmaus, e -M -E -M -M um, the occasion of the two when Mary was taken for the gardener, and the disciples on Galilee after a fruitless night of fishing. Um, you know, there were times they didn't recognize him until he spoke to them or whatever, and then boom, they could see. All right. So we're establishing here that Jesus physically died, that Jesus physically was raised from the dead. This is not, you know, conjecture or, or you know, and we, we just discount any, any theories and any ideas and any godless teaching that teaches he didn't. That's, that's, that's just right out of the straight pit of the hell. These are people who educated beyond their intelligence. They went and studied these things in order to disprove the Bible instead of proving it. And, um, that, that's, and they come up with just human reasonings. And we don't accept human reasonings of men over the Word of God. Now let's look at some proofs of Christ's resurrection. Um, there's so much material to cover here. We could, we could, we could spend, uh, I'm, I'm, this is more of an overview, kind of a New Testament survey of you know, uh, salvation. The empty tomb, number one. In Matthew 28, verse 6, the angel bore witness that the tomb was empty. He is not here, for he is risen. 
as he said, come see where the place where the Lord lay. The woman, the women found the tomb empty. Luke 24 and 3. Um, they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Mary Magdalene testified the same. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom John, whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They have taken away uh, the, the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. John 20 and 2. <coughs> that his body had been stolen from the sepulcher was a story told by the soldiers only after they were bribed. And when they were assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his body, came, his disciples came by night, stole him away while we slept. Now, let me say this. That would have been a death penalty to those soldiers to have actually fallen asleep. They were Roman soldiers under orders from Roman authority to guard that sepulcher. There was a seal put on that sepulcher. For them to go out and, you know, go to sleep, they, they could have been executed basically for treason against the emperor. And when they assembled the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will, see, we will persuade. In other words, look, we're going we're to cover you with the governor. You tell them this, and then we'll go to the governor and say, look, we're trying to stop, you know, uh, uh, all this stuff by, you know, him, them saying he was raised from the dead. So we're, we paid them to go out and lie. And you need, to, you, know, you need to give them a break. You need to cover them on this. Okay? And not execute them for treason because they, they had an order to guard that sepulcher and secure you. So we're going, we, we have enough favor with the governor that we're going to protect you. Okay? Uh, they were the Gestapo of their day. They, worked in, they were working in, in, in uh, cahoots with the, the uh, version of the KGB back then. And um, that, that's basically what they were doing. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Matthew 28, 12 through 15 stated that. They, they took that, you know, they had, the, uh, they had the lying mainstream media supporting their narrative of lies. Okay. Now, such a happening would be utterly unlikely. The disciples were so filled with discouragement and timidity, it is doubtful they would have had the courage to perpetuate such an act. Um, in 1879, a Roman edict was found stating that it was illegal under the penalty of death to rob a tomb or to move a body from one place to another. Thus, the disciples would have been guilty of death. It is amazing that the enemies of Christ remembered what the disciples had forgotten. Now the next day, that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember. The deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away. Matthew 27, 62 and 64. Note how well by the body was secured. A huge stone was rolled over the door to the sepulcher. It was sealed with the official Roman seal. It was watched over by a Roman guard. The guards would have placed their lives in jeopardy if they had allowed the body to be stolen. Further, if they had been asleep, how would they have known what took place? How would you know that somebody came and stole the body if you were asleep? And there's somebody that chewing going, oh, well, uh, well, a stone so big, that, a big stone to block the entrance, and then a Roman seal put on that stone. To break that seal was death penalty. The grave clothes. And he, that is John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and see at the linen cloths, in essence, the napkin, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Um, it was customary for the Jews who had who'd adopted Egyptian forms of embalming 
um, to wind long strips of cloth around a body from the neck to the feet, preparing it for burial. Of Lazarus, um, we, we read, and he was dead, came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his faith was bound about with a napkin. Uh, that's in John eleven forty four. These strips of cloth would have become impregnated with the vast weight of spices that were used for embalming, and they hardened. They basically formed a cocoon. Um, so that the whole the whole thing would become a form of a cocoon. Jesus' body apparently slipped out of this, leaving the clothes undisturbed on the napkin that was about the face. Now here's what they here's, here's part of the reason for that. Um, only the napkin from about his face was removed, possibly to let it be seen that his body was not within. But the Jews believed that the spirit left through the face, and so when they 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 embalmed him, they left the face unwrapped and just laid a napkin over it so the spirit could escape now this is just tradition these are tradition things these are not just you know these aren't biblical these aren't you know facts that the, the spirit came out of the face it's just that they believed that and therefore that's why they embalmed the way they did everything except the face and laid a napkin over it when they come into the sepulcher the the cocooned lin uh, burial clothing the the cloth the uh, embalming uh, egyptian style embalming was was hardened into a, a the shape of a body with no body in it, and the napkin was folded up and laid off to the side. So Jesus took it and laid it to the side when he came when he was raised from the dead. <coughs> Hallelujah. Um. Anyone who attempted to steal the body would, in such a haste, not taken time to unroll the clothes from a corpse and replace the clothes as they were. Besides, why would one wish to have a new dead body? Uh, if the lie were true and the disciples did steal the body of the Lord, it is incredible that they would have been inspired and willing to devote their lives to the propagation of a colossal falsehood. Remember, Peter was crucified upside down for bearing witness to the um, death and burial and resurrection of Christ. <coughs> if it really didn't happen, it'd be kind of hard for him to go die for it. Hello? Okay, um, each of the disciples, with the possible exception of John, were reputed to die, have suffered a martyr's death for the message he proclaimed. Uh, now, John, they tried to martyr him. Um, Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us they tried to boil him in oil, uh, and that didn't work, and so they banished him to the Isle of Patmos. You know, dropped him in the oil, and he came out like the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. Glory to God. Um. It might be conceivable that if the disciples were together in a group, they would have encouraged each other to sustain each other and agree to die for a lie. But each one was alone when he sealed his faith with his blood. So we have, you know, all the disciples died for Christ uh, as a martyr's death. They just couldn't kill John. And um, praise the Lord. The, the death and the resurrection of Christ was not challenged until the first century. And according to Fitzwater, the apostles preached the resurrection of Christ immediately after it occurred. Um, and in the very region where it took place, they placed the guilt of killing the Jesus Christ upon the very ones who had committed the deed. And if Christ was really not risen from the dead, it could and would have been disproved. But there is no hint in history, sacred or profane, of anyone's challenging this fact of the apostles' preaching. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. People have been coming out saying, no, he, went. He's he was dead. You guys are just lying. They, they don't have any record of that. And uh, what in the world was that? Well, we'll find out. All right. All that would have been necessary would have been for them to, them to have proven that Jesus was dead was to produce his body. It was all a lie. They all kept lying about it in order to, you know, to, to stop the spread of the message that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, remember, he was seen of the disciples. He was seen of more than 500 before his ascension into heaven. Glory to God. to the first of the day of the week 
And that, that custom has continued down to our times is in effect that must have had a great cause. The change was made to celebrate the fact that the Lord rose on the first day of the week. It became, became known as the Lord's Day. Uh, Acts 20 and 7 and 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. Um, and then the Christian church. There's never been another institution in all of history that has produced so much good in this life as well in giving promise of the life that is to come. The Christian church stands alone. The real historical evidence for the resurrection is the fact that it was believed, preached, propagated, produced its fruit and effect in a new phenomenon of the Christian church long before any of our gospels were written. They weren't written, you know, the day that Jesus died and was raised. 60, 70 years later, they were written. Okay, they were, <coughs> excuse me, they were put to paper or to parchment and written and they ultimately became canon in the church. And then the New Testament. This is the book of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Had it not been for this event, the book would have never been written. Evans concludes, if Jesus Christ had remained buried in the grave, the story of his life and death would have been buried with him. The resurrection does not grow out of the beautiful story of his life, but the beautiful story of his life grew out of the fact of his resurrection. Glory to God. I said glory to God. And y'all out there, give me an amen. I'm going to put on heart out there for myself. Hallelujah. Praise God. The, the, the fact that his life has meaning. I, you know, I preach a sermon uh, on, um, um, well, sometimes I preach it at Christmas, sometimes at Easter, but, you know, it's called The Child Grew Up. Because, you see, the baby, the manger, has no significance without the Christ on the cross and the empty tomb, subsequent empty tomb. Without those events, the baby in the manger means nothing. There wouldn't even have been a story about it. It would have died years. It would have died uh, when he died. There, there wouldn't have been. There would not have been a Christian church. There wouldn't have been uh, Paul's writings. I mean, Paul has such a supernatural encounter with Jesus that he he wrote the vast majority of New Testament doctrine by far. Hallelujah. The results and benefits um, of his resurrection. You know, there's benefits from Jesus being raised from the dead. Number one, it provides a firm foundation for our faith in God. It provides a firm foundation for our faith in God. Who by him do we believe in God that raised him up from the dead? And gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. 1 Peter 1.21 Only God can raise the dead. He proved that he is God when he raised up Jesus. Secondly, in Jesus Christ, um, his resurrection is a firm affirmation that he is all he claimed to be. The very son of God. Romans 1.4 and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Christ was not made to be the Son of God by his resurrection. He was declared to be. Hallelujah. Had Christ remained in the tomb, there would have been no reason to believe he was any different than all those who had died before him. The Jews twice asked Jesus to show them a sign by which they might believe. And in each case, he gave them a sign that pointed to his death and his resurrection. The first was that of Jonah being three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Matthew 12, 38 through 40. The second pointed to the destruction of the rebuild and the rebuilding of the temple of his body in John 2, 18 through 21. And so... Um, he was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection, not made the Son of God by his resurrection. Hallelujah. And that another benefit of, of the resurrection, it provides assurance of the forgiveness of sins. 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, <clears throat> from the dead, uh, thou shalt be saved. You know, when you're 62 years old and your voice is still cracking down, I guess that means you've got another 60, 70 years out there in front of you. Hallelujah. You're just, you're just beginning to get into puberty there. Oh, my. Romans 10 and 9. So go ahead and laugh, folks. Come on now. Um, the sinner's justification is confirmed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Romans 4, 25. Only by his resurrection can the believer have confidence that God was satisfied with the sacrifice Jesus had made in his behalf. Indeed, the new birth is said to be accomplished because of his resurrection. <coughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, glory to God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. We have an understanding. Merciful and faithful high priest in heaven. Hebrews 2.17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Romans 18, 8, 20, um, 34, 8, 34 says, Who is he that uh, condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, and also maketh intercession for us. Talking about his high priestly ministry. Hallelujah. Christ who died, yea, is risen again. Uh, you know, and then Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So as a, as a high priest, he died for us, was raised from us, and now he ever lives to make intercession for us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Next, it assures the believer that all the needed power for life and service is available. <coughs> The Apostle Paul expressed the greatest desire of life when he said in Philemon 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. This great miracle which always stirred faith in the followers of God in Old Testament days was the deliverance of the children of um, of Israel from Egypt. Time after time, the prophets stirred faith in the people, reminding of what God had done for their families at the Red Sea. The greatest demonstration of God's power in the New Testament is the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead. And indeed, this seems to be the yardstick by which God's power is measured. Paul's prayer for the saints at Ephesus uh, states, states that we might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? Glory to God. The exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. That power that he worked in Christ when? When he raised him from the dead. <coughs> we're talking about the, the power of God working in your life, working in you, working in everything you're putting your hand to, working in your physical body is the same power that raised Jesus up from the dead. And if that don't put some shouting shoes on, nothing will. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't see little dancing people running across my screen. Hallelujah. You know, little John Travolta type stuff. Glory to God. Or you can put a chicken, do a Pentecostal chicken. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. The believer has the assurance of resurrection and, and, and immortality. 
1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Um, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus uh, shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. 2 Corinthians 4.14 because I live, you shall live also, Jesus said in John 14, 19. Glory to God. Amen. And we got other scriptures we could give you. In John 5, 14, we read, Death reigned from Adam to Moses. As a dread monarch on a sepulchral throne, death had continued to reign over the sons of men. Each succeeding generation had arisen full of hope only to go down before the same deadly foe. In Hosea 13, 14, God had challenged, Oh, death. I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. But still, death reigned. But now, oh, glory to God. But now, in the resurrection of Jesus, death was defeated. Hallelujah. Christ defeated death, not avoiding it, but by enduring and conquering it. Through death, he destroyed him. Through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil, Hebrews 2.14. The power of his resurrection conquered the power of death. In one of the last pictures we have of Jesus, the Savior, he has what? In Revelation 1.18, the keys of hell and death. So in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Hallelujah. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. Makes you think of that Keith Moore song. Now, thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God, which gives me the victory. He gives me the victory. He gives me the victory. Um, anyway, amen. Glory. Make you shout for Jesus. Praise God. So don't go, don't go away. If I start seeing numbers go down, because I'll stop singing. Hallelujah. And it guarantees the certainty of a day of judgment. There will be a time of judgment for both the godly and the ungodly. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. In Acts 17, 31. Evans declares that the resurrection of Christ is God's unfailing testimony to the coming day of judgment. The one is as sure as the other. Glory to God. Now here, we, we enter into the judgment of life because you're born again. Hallelujah. Jesus was raised from the dead. It's a fact. Hallelujah. And if you believe on him, it confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. <coughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I got people out there were running. Got running folks out there. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love my church. You people are awesome. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're so glad you joined us tonight. Next week, we're going to pick up on the ascension and glorification of Jesus Christ. So we've covered the need for the, uh, for the death of Christ, the fact that it was a bodily, physical death, that he was resurrected, that it was a bodily, physical resurrection, and that there were benefits that apply to us as individuals through that resurrection. Glory to God. And so we, next week we're going to get into the ascension and the glorification of Christ and continuing to move along in this subject of the doctrine of salvation. Praise God. Uh, at this time, it's time to receive our weekly offering for Wednesday nights. Uh, if you're watching and uh, you want to you know, give through electronic means, we use PayPal and or uh, the cash app, uh, it's a square cash, but they just call it cash app now, that little green box on your apps with a little dollar sign on it, um, which is the most effective way. The second set most effective is PayPal. Um, but, you know, you know, whichever one you use, that's fine. Glory to God. Um, 
<coughs> you can give uh, to the church. Um, we have a we have a special need right going on right now. Uh, we had to buy a new Mevo camera. Ours was over five years old, and uh, we think it just cooked. It um, was starting to do some quirky things and weird things. And this past Sunday, it just got so hot we couldn't even. It turned off, wouldn't turn back on. Um, we've just been having some trouble with it for for a while, and so we purchased the newest newest one, newest stuff. Had to do it. But if you want to help give towards that, you can. And just in a special offering for that, glory to God. Those watching coming Sunday, you want to bring a check, that's fine. Um, it costs us $650 to buy everything, new stand, new camera, new cables, new power supply, new this, new that, hallelujah, uh, all the things that we needed for it. But praise God, it, this is what you're watching it on tonight. I don't know if it's any better. Is it way better? Okay, it's way better, they said. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really aware. Um, so I look really, it looks like really better. Okay, it looks really bad. I don't know if you're watching, maybe you think it looks really better. Glory. Who? The Schubert said it looks great. Thank you, Schubert. Praise God. So we have a $650 need. You want to give to that to take care of this so we can continue to broadcast online with the, the state's new possibility of, of locking us back down after today's news conference. We don't know what's coming. Um, they're kind of prepping us for something. And um, <coughs> we need to be able to continue to reach out to our people and to all those who watch us online uh, into our congregation if, if we can't all meet in person. So um, we just, this is important technology that we have to continue to have uh, so we can continue to reach everyone uh, getting through this, this craziness. We're victorious, but, you know, people shut down buildings and all this kind of stuff, and you can't make people open their buildings. So we just, you know, I'm just saying that's, that's the stuff that's going on. So please be, please be a part. Supply that. Uh, also, if you want to give to our building fund, that's out there. Uh, we are we are over almost – over halfway to 17,000 from 16. Uh, we're like 16, 690 or something like that. So we're moving up. Uh, actually, some more came in today, so it's over 16.7. Hallelujah. Uh, that's just awesome. Praise God. We're moving on up. Hallelujah. And, um, <coughs> and of course, your general tithe and offering. If you're giving to the general church fund, uh, general accounting for your, with your tithe, praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless all those who get involved in our church through giving. We thank you they are blessed abundantly. We thank you heaven's windows are open unto them, and they receive blessings they can't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. God bless you. I want you to remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you, and we'll see you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online. Good night.